this evening is about self-compassion because I don't think we can ever have too much self-compassion and um, a lot of the time we don't have enough at least I speak for myself there so I think the title is something like the medicine of self-compassion because it can be a medicine that uh, hopefully helps to alleviate some of the suffering the distress um, the difficulties in life and lead us closer towards freedom from suffering so it's a wonderful quality because it's both intimately connected with the suffering that's an inevitable part of life whilst at the same time focusing on that freedom from suffering and this is what makes it uplifting and a pleasant abiding one of the Brahma Viharas. So we're going to talk about that and I wanted to start with a meditation as usual. Uh, is my face high enough up? <laughs> So I wanted to start with a meditation and perhaps do something slightly different from, uh, from usual. Uh, this is shared from some self-compassion techniques that I've read about in a, a book by Paul Gilbert, who's um, one of the scientific researchers who's done a lot of studies on self-compassion. And uh, so I thought we'd do a whole combination of things during the meditation, but as usual, um, it's all an invitation and if something doesn't feel helpful to you or you just feel like you want to take a different path your mind's just you know wants to hang out or or have a more spacious sense of awareness or maybe just go to your breath please feel free to do that um, but if anything feels inviting or you'd like to try it then you're most welcome to do that too and of course with all the meditation there's no particular result that we're seeking it's just we're meditating for the sake of meditating, for inclining our minds towards the Dhamma and for just giving ourselves the gift of peace. You know, this is already a great act of self-compassion to just to turn up and to turn up to yourself as you are with whatever you're going through right now, whether it's um, joyful or, or difficult, painful or, um, or easeful. You know, it's all part of life. It's all part of our common humanity. So well done for the first step in turning up and it's uh, nice to be with everybody. So let's settle down and have maybe half an hour or so of meditation. And uh, please spend some time asking your body how it would like to sit rather than just assuming that you know. Sometimes we think it's worked one way in the past so that's the way I have to sit today, but sometimes your body actually wants something different. You might be too sleepy to sit up straight. You might want to lean back or put an extra cushion there in the small of the back. You might even want to lie down, which is totally acceptable as well. And gently, when you're ready, closing your eyes. Just allowing the impressions of this Zoom room, the people's faces to perhaps accompany you into the meditation. Recognizing the presence, the friendship, the support of being in the group. But just allowing those uh, visual impressions to fade. Noticing how much disappears when your eyes are closed. <clears throat> so really allowing yourself to come in contact with your body. Wherever your mind naturally makes that contact. And just checking through each part, just in a general way, not in detail, to see if there's any anything else you can adjust. Maybe shuffle, maybe loosen, to give your body a feeling of comfort and ease. Respecting the body's wishes.
I'd like to invite you, if you wish, to take some deep breaths. I'll give further instruction. It's going to be quite precise. So we're going to breathe in, but breathe into our belly, allowing it to expand to the count of five. And then breathe out to the count of five. I can count with you. So breathing in to the belly, two, three, four, five. Breathing out, two, three, four, five. Breathing in, two, three, four, five. Breathing out, two, three, four, five. And just do this for a few more breaths. This is a very soothing and calming breath that relaxes the vagus nerve, relaxes the body and produces a feeling of calm. It also has some health benefits as well. Just gently relaxing the breath now, but staying connected to the inhale and the exhale. Like waves coming in to shore. Flowing back out into the sea. seamlessly with no break at all. So just staying with that flow, allowing the breath to become natural, allowing the mind to rest on the breath. So I'd like to lead us in a self-compassion exercise if you would wish to follow. And as I say, please just pick up whatever might seem helpful to you. So if you're comfortable, you can stay with the breath or any feelings in the body. And at the same time, imagine yourself as a very 
compassionate, deeply compassionate person. Maybe an aspect of yourself that you're familiar with or it could be that you imagine an older, wiser, more mature version of yourself. It doesn't matter, we're just acting right now as though we were that very compassionate, wise, and kind being. And you're viewing your experience through these wise, compassionate eyes. You might notice that your body relaxes slightly more deeply. And as part of this imagination, you may find it helps to wear a slight smile. So I'm going to gently suggest some qualities that this compassionate being yourself might have. And you can just see how those qualities sit for you, how they resonate. Imagine as part of this compassionate being, you also have wisdom and a deep sense of calm. You understand that whatever you experience is not personal. but just part of your humanity. Our common humanity. Just as the breath flows in falls away like waves in the sea. So everything rises and passes away.
And another aspect of yourself is this great kindness and warmth. The ability to meet whatever arises with a kind and open heart. With the warmth that a mother would have towards the child. How does it feel to infuse your experience with kindness and warmth? Be kind to each breath, allowing it to be. Simply offering warm companionship to your breathing, to your body, to your mind. And the next quality you can notice is strength. A strength which is sensitive and courageous. Which is able to be present to difficulties, to emotional pain, and stay steady in the midst of suffering. Not afraid to experience whatever you experience. strong enough to include it all. You connect to your strength, your courage, your sensitivity.
And lastly, embodying the aspect of non-criticalness, non-judgment, whilst also taking responsibility for a positive change, your compassionate wish to be free from suffering, in a non-judgmental, non-critical way. Staying connected to your body, to your breath. And if you wish, you can drop in some phrases of self-compassion. Such as, may I learn to be kind to myself. Or may I learn to care for this pain or anxiety or fear. May I be safe and free from suffering. Notice the resonance of these wishes. Allowing your mind to follow in that direction of caring for yourself and wishing yourself freedom from suffering.
opening up to receive your own care. To enjoy any sense of comfort, soothing, maybe ease or peace in the mind. As this wise, compassionate, strong, sensitive being who wishes you freedom from harm. just as I wish to learn to be kind to myself, to be free from suffering, may all beings be kind to themselves, care for their pain, be safe and free from suffering. And if you wish, you can imagine that on the in-breath, you're breathing in this self-compassion and on the out breath, offering compassion to all beings. Breathing in, nourishing your body, your mind. Breathing out, may all beings be free from suffering. Picturing the beings happy and at ease. Imagining yourself completely free from suffering, happy and at ease. sharing this happiness with others. I'll do a very small little chanting to end. Just some words of the Brahma Viharas 
If you wish, you can join in. We won't hear you. You can join in from your own quiet space. You're all muted. <laughs> Meta Karuna Rudita Upeika 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 Meta Karuna Rudita <laughs> Some of you want to do the three big sadhus. <laughs> Go on then, sadhu. <laughs> it's nice to see some of you chanting along. <laughs> we have to do it in person someday and get some harmonies going. <laughs> That's really good fun. <laughs> Great. So that was a bit different than usual, but I hope you enjoyed it or something in there you may want to pick up and uh, continue to practice, just experiment with in your own time. <laughs> it's interesting when we sort of imagine ourselves to be this compassionate person, because I do find that I, I can connect to that part of myself, you know, almost like the big sister part of me, the wiser, more mature sort of me on best form part, <laughs> which is there, right? And we sometimes forget and get pulled down into our usual small and limited sense of self. Hopefully less and less so, <laughs> but it still happens to me as well, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about self-compassion today, because I feel that I also could do with a little um, rousing on the subject. And um, another thing that, uh, sort of encouraged me to give this talk was partly because I'm giving a, a retreat next weekend on theme of mudita, which is, um, you could say another aspect of love. You could almost look at the Brahma Viharas as four different aspects of loving kindness. The metta is the kind of most fundamental foundational of all the Brahma Viharas. It's the, um, just the general sense of wishing all beings well. It's very general, it's unconditional, it's universal. And it goes to all beings, you know, regardless of how they're feeling or their status in this world. Uh, all living beings is usually the, um, the only condition there, the only uh, category. And of course, if we're beings, then we have to be alive. <laughs> Pana means breathing beings. So all Panas, so be Pana. All living beings, breathing beings. And then the compassion is the second one of these. And compassion is almost, you can think of it as the way that love meets suffering, the way love responds when it meets suffering. So it's coming a little bit closer there into a more intimate connection to the first noble truth, but also the third noble truth, which is the freedom from that suffering, yeah? Um, so compassion is, um, you can define it in different ways. One of the ways I most, enjoy is um, the wish 
for all beings, including oneself, to be free from suffering and the causes, and to, um, to act to alleviate the suffering of oneself and others. So this is an important bit. It's not just getting attuned to the suffering and sort of rolling in the suffering and becoming heavy and burdened by that, but it's actually this wish for freedom from suffering. And this is what makes it, as I said in the beginning, a divine abiding, a beautiful place to be in the mind because we're focused on that freedom from suffering. But it also has the beautiful, um, skillful aspect of not being, uh, not bypassing suffering because sometimes with the practices of metta and mudita, we can get a little bit complacent if we're not careful and maybe close down a little bit to some of the suffering that's there in the world, you know, because our general pattern is to turn away from suffering, not to turn towards it. So compassion actually helps us to turn towards suffering because it empowers the mindfulness with more resilience, more warmth, more strength, all those beautiful qualities we discussed in the meditation, the wisdom. Yeah, understanding that uh, all beings desire freedom from suffering. Um, they desire to live and not to die, just as I do too. And so it's a very beautiful Brahma Vihara that really brings us back in touch with reality, but that can also be balanced with the metta and the mudita so that we remember there's also happiness in the world. And I think it's so important at this particular time, you know, while we're going through a global pandemic. I got an email from a friend. Um, yesterday I think or a couple of days ago and she said oh it's uh, only middle of January can you believe it January has got, seems so long and I don't know why but my mood's really low and I had to smile when I read that because I thought really you don't know why <laughs> I don't know about you but I am not immune from the suffering in the world around me and um, sometimes the weight of that really weighs me down and uh, quite often I sort of wake up and I think mm, there's a sort of heaviness or there's a sense of maybe isolation even desperation at times feeling kind of am I still connected with the world or am I just going to be in this bubble for the next you know four or five months and then I'll read in the news about the you know the death toll of the day and you see all these statistics and that's difficult enough, but you know, we remember that these are not just statistics, these are human beings, these are human lives that perhaps didn't need to end so soon. And I don't see how we can really be completely immune or, or like in our bubble away from that. And I guess the question for me is, it, would that even be desirable? Or is it somehow more in service of compassion in the world if we can actually tap into that and also um, respond in a skillful way. And so these Brahma Viharas become even more important in times like this, you know, as ways that we can um, affect the world. There's very little we can do at the moment with the political situation that's kind of pretty volatile in, in many parts of the world. There's also the climate crisis. Um, there's only so much we can do. Actually, one of the great things we can do is stay at home and stop getting in our cars and on the aeroplanes. Um, but there's, you know, sometimes it seems as though the world is moving towards its own destruction in, in rather a, a quick and scary way. You know, we have affected um, the ecosystems in the world in, in ways that are starting to, you know, engender more pandemics and there may be more to come. So sometimes trying to control that external world only leads to frustration. But what we can do is see where we do have the power to influence. And I wouldn't like to say the word control, but where we can really help to bring about well-being and happiness in this world. And of course, that starts with ourself by overcoming those forces within the greed, hatred and delusion that lead to so much trouble in the first place. We can address these things within ourselves. And it's to resource ourselves in that journey, we can use these beautiful Brahma Viharas, which have a sense of um, pleasantness, of happiness, of resourcefulness about them, so that we're not only swamped in the difficult, we're not only contending with you know, the negative aspects of our defilements, but also looking at how to cultivate the opposites. And that's what Ajahn Brown means when he says we cultivate the flowers and not water the weeds. Yeah. So if you cultivate the flowers, 
and you don't worry too much about the weeds, at some point those flowers will kind of overtake your garden and smother those weeds completely away. So compassion is a very, very skillful way to, um, to do this. And um, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about self-compassion too, also from the perspective of the early Buddhist texts, because I read a very interesting um, article from Bhante Analio recently. Um, somehow I got on his newsletter list and he writes like incredible tombs worth of, you know, really um, academic articles, which have all the sort of research, the latest research. And, and he's a great um, advocate for the early Buddhist teachings, trying to link current methods, current sort of um, uh, therapies on self-compassion back to the early Buddhist texts. So it's really interesting because what he found out is that um, most of the time in the early Buddhist texts, they don't talk about sending metta to different people. So they don't categorize sending metta to oneself or a loved one or you know, a difficult person. They actually talk mostly about radiating these Brahma Viharas in all directions. And that's the early Buddhist uh, model. So I wanted to read a couple of uh, passages which uh, capture this because there's such beautiful language used here. And this one's from Majjhima Nikaya 99. Um, I'm not sure what the name of the sutta is, but you can look it up afterwards, number 99. So I'll, it goes for all four Brahma Viharas, but I'll talk about it in the context of compassion. So here the Buddha tells a young Brahmin, here Brahmin, someone dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So it's going right around us. So above and below, around and everywhere, and in every way, one dwells pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. When the liberation of mind by compassion is developed in this way, no limiting comma remains there, none persists there. Just as a vigorous trumpeter could make themselves heard without difficulty in the four quarters, so too when the liberation of mind by compassion is developed, in this way there's no limiting comma remaining there, non persisting there. So it's a really beautiful image, you know, of this trumpet, or I think in some sutras it's the conch shell, I'm not sure. Maybe that's my experience in Ladakh because they used to be in these monasteries. They would have trumpets as well, but they'd also have conch shells and they sort of blow them out across all the valleys and it'd just reach, you know, probably, I don't know, maybe even into the next valley in every direction. And it's a really beautiful um, image there of the way that compassion can just flow outwards and meet whoever it meets on the way. There's no, you know, speak of uh, particular individual beings. And this is how the mind can then come to a place of oneness, a place of unity, and actually get into these uh, jhanas through the Brahma Viharas. So that's what it means when the Buddha says um, that the mind is liberated through that. It doesn't mean fully enlightened, but it does mean liberated from the five hindrances and even from the five senses in really deep samadhi. So that's all very well. <laughs> and it's wonderful if we can sit there and just start radiating compassion, you know, in every direction without any kind of limits and any obstructions. But um, of course, when we actually sit down to practice, we do find obstacles. And there's another sutta, it's I think the last one I'm going to read to you, but it follows on from that one. Because this one is where the Buddha's talking to the Kalamas. You might have heard this sutta, you probably know this sutta is the one where the Buddha says, don't believe in anything I say just because it follows tradition or just because I say it or just because it agrees with what you previously thought. Only when you find out that, it, yes, this is good, this is beneficial, and this leads to the end of suffering, only then take that as true and correct. So the Buddha was really explaining to these Kalamas, I think they live somewhere around middle India, like around New Delhi, actually modern day New Delhi, um, he was explaining to them how not to get sucked into different people's doctrines and how to sort of um, identify um, what is the true Dhamma in the sense of the Dhamma that leads you to your own and to others' good. 
But another part of this sutta is interesting because now he's going on to the practice of loving kindness. And here he's saying that we need to first know, yeah, what things are wholesome and what things are blameless, what things are praised by the wise, and what, if accepted and under, undertaken, would lead to welfare and happiness. And then he talks about the practice of compassion and the other Brahma Viharas. So here he says, the noble disciple. Okay, so this is somebody in the higher practice, but this could be anybody. So one who is devoid of longing, devoid of ill will, unconfused, clearly comprehending, and ever mindful, dwells pervading one quarter with a mind of compassion. Likewise, the second, third, and fourth, and it carries on. So above and below, everywhere, to all as to oneself, yeah? And so here we see that there are some preliminary steps we need to take in order to be able to extend our compassion or our loving kindness or our sympathetic joy in every direction. This is possible for one devoid of longing, devoid of ill will, unconfused, clearly comprehending that sampajanya, and mindful, so they have sati sampajanya already, right? And they already have overcome a lot of these five hindrances. So it's the same training as it is in the whole of the gradual training that there is some preliminary work to do. <clears throat> and then, yes, in this one, it does say to all as to oneself, which is interesting because even though self-compassion is not taught as a separate practice in early Buddhism, it is understood to sort of that oneself is the foundation in the sense that we can reason to ourselves, okay, well, I wouldn't want someone to harm me, you know, um, I wouldn't want to be hurt, I wouldn't want to die. And so also, nor do any other beings, all beings value their life, all beings, you know, flee from suffering and all beings desire their own happiness. So in that sense, when we radiate metta or compassion to all beings, we also receive some of that compassion as well, even without a separate practice of um, self-compassion. But the way to achieve that state of being able to radiate it out then is obviously, again, through the path of virtue, right? So, and also sense restraint. And one of the ways that I was noticing that I sometimes slip with this, it's not an obvious breakage of sila, but I think that, you know, sometimes when we don't have enough self-compassion, we forget what's for our harm and what's for our good. It almost doesn't matter too much to us anymore, you know, and compassion is known as the antidote to cruelty, to harm, to violence even. And of course, I don't consider myself a violent person. I hope that I'm, you know, not actually actively harming another being. But when I see what I do to myself, sometimes I can see it's moving in that direction it's moving in the direction of harming myself for example one of the ways it manifests for me is that I just push myself too hard you know I just want to do too well or I want to like tell you everything about self-compassion in like a half hour talk <laughs> you know and so I'm kind of come on mind come on mind like what's the way you could put it what story can you tell you know and then I just realize oh maybe I could just back off a little bit here this comes from a sort of perfectionist streak the way I'm conditioned to feel that, you know, I need to be, yeah, always sort of high performing or always so great to help everyone else. And, and this can move into being a little bit hard on oneself. Another thing I notice when um, the self-compassion isn't perhaps uh, the priority that it needs to be is that I don't eat quite well enough, you know, Perhaps I could have taken a bit more time and really considered what my body needs. Or perhaps I could meditate earlier in the day. Sometimes I, I wait until it's quite late at night. I've got into this habit now of sitting quite late. So last night it was 10 o'clock and then it was half 11 before I finished my meditation. So I thought, oh, well, that's OK. You know, you had a nice sit. I wasn't sleepy, but... But of course, when you miss that little bit of sleep before midnight, the quality is never quite so good. So even little things like this, you know, seemingly small things um, do indicate that self-compassion could be slightly improved. Yeah, there might be a need for a little bit more kindness and care. And, you know, it's, it's important to say that self-compassion doesn't mean just like indulgence. It doesn't mean just like eating chocolate and having a, a bubble bath. 
that's a kind of looking after yourself, but it also borders on indulgence and self-compassion is not indulgence. Self-compassion is really looking at how we can be kinder to ourselves, how we can really um, stop this sense of harm. You know, we want to come out of harming ourselves and learn to be the opposite of violent, which is extremely gentle and kind. Yeah, it's the make, it's the be gentle in Ajahn Brahm's make peace, be kind, be gentle. Yeah, the be gentle is the uh, compassion, the non-harm. It literally means uh, avihimsaka. It's like Mahatma Gandhi's ahimsa, like non-violence. And then maybe you also notice this. I think all of us have it, but one of the other ways I notice that uh, I'm slipping from self-compassion is when those denigrating thoughts come into the mind. You know, sometimes uh, these days in meditation circles, we call them the inner tyrant or the inner critic, you know, just thoughts which uh, put ourselves down. You know, like yesterday with the same example, I was thinking for quite a long time, you really should be meditating. You know, it's eight o'clock now. Oh, now it's nine o'clock. Oh, no, you've just wasted an hour. <laughs> you know, and I had this dialogue happening, which was completely unnecessary because I, I did meditate, you know. And as I sat down to practice, I thought, yeah, what was the problem here? You know, I'm having a nice meditation. I'm offering myself this space. I didn't actually need those voices in my head. And they've actually done some study to show that if you do have a lot of self-critical voices, it tends to lead more to procrastination than it does to getting things done, <laughs> right? I mean, that's why teachers at schools hopefully don't keep on criticizing the kids or telling them to work harder, but they actually try and give them encouragement because encouragement is always the best motivator. So can we learn to speak to ourselves in encouraging ways with words that are kind and, you know, which regard ourselves positively, which sort of value the qualities we have and value our own time as well. One of the um, definitions of right speech is to use words that go to the heart and also words that are worth recording. <laughs> so, you know, when we have these negative self thoughts, nobody can record it. But remember, it doesn't only mean the words that come out of your mouth. It also means the words that you say to yourself. Are they really worth recording? Would you like to, you know, put them down on a tape and have someone else find them and listen to the way you talk to yourself? Probably not. <laughs> On the other hand, you could, of course, make a recording of saying, may I be free from suffering, may I be, you know, may I be kind to myself and listen to that instead. Maybe you can have a bit of brainwashing that way. So these are different ways that, you know, that we can actually um, overcome some of those uh, hindrances to the meditation and we can improve our conduct mentally as well as in action and speech in our daily life. And then the next way to achieve this state, I mean, achieve is a funny word, but to work towards being able to radiate compassion is to do the systemic practice. Yeah, starting with different types of being. And as I said, in the compassion, it doesn't actually start with oneself. It starts with somebody who's really suffering. So you actually think and bring to mind someone who's struggling, someone who's in distress or in emotional pain. And uh, sometimes I do think of certain political leaders. A lot of the time I don't. But when I was <laughs> reflecting on this earlier, I thought, gosh, you know, sometimes people are really suffering and they have no idea how they got to that state. They don't have the wisdom and discernment to know what went wrong in their life. You know, how can you even begin to look at somebody who's doing so much harm to others and is in such a sorry state themselves? Really, compassion is the only appropriate response. And so they don't wish to be this way, you know, but they don't know a better path. So it's interesting that sometimes we're encouraged to start with a person who's really suffering. But I would say don't start with somebody very difficult. And then we spread it to the different groups. And we don't preclude ourselves because if you go through the Brahma Viharas sequentially, you already start with metta for yourself. So this kind of accomplishes the removing of self-aversion and um you know, it starts to develop a more wholesome relationship with ourself. And as we start to extend the compassion, of course, we become a recipient too, because we are right in the middle of that field of compassion that we're generating to others. So we do get our share. 
But um, I actually think, yeah, one of the reasons that, you know, they don't talk about self-compassion so much in the suttas is because compassion should always have an altruistic sense about it. It should always be around um, widening the circle and thinking of relieving the suffering of all beings. So this stops it from becoming too self-interested. But at the same time, I really do feel that there's a place for self-compassion because a lot of the time for us, perhaps who've been educated in sort of Western education systems or in capitalist, capitalist societies, I think that we sometimes find it easier to widen the circle of compassion to others and to generate it out than to actually include ourselves in that circle. And we actually need to learn to bring ourselves in. So I think there is a place for compassion, but what I want to say from you know, reading this article was that it's important to maintain a sense of the overall context, that we're starting with ourselves, or maybe spending a lot of time with ourselves, but ultimately we want to bring in that altruism. You know, the altruism that um, motivated the Buddha to teach. He taught out of compassion for the well-being of everybody, yeah? for the benefit and welfare of all beings. It wasn't a selfish enlightenment. It wasn't that I've done my bit, now you, do, you figure it out yourself. No, you know, there was always that intention to be able to spread it, to be able to be of benefit to the world. And so, you know, our own well-being is intimately connected to the well-being of others. And I think we need self-compassion because if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't know how to be kind to ourselves, to look after ourselves, our basic needs, and also to comfort ourselves when we do face disappointments and distress, then we're not going to be of much service to others. You know, we're going to run ourselves dry. Also, if we have too much empathy for others and we sort of get sucked into their compassion, but we forget to focus on the freedom from suffering, then it can move into empathetic distress rather than compassion. And although empathy, I feel, is a really important part of compassion in terms of being able to see how and um, where to help, you know, um, it's important that we don't empathize so much that we also get dragged down because then we're really of no benefit to anyone. And the Buddha said, you know, in another sutta that there are four kinds of practitioner. He said that one is the person who practices for neither oneself or anyone else's benefit. So obviously this is like the rock bottom practitioner, right? They're just doing it, goodness knows for what. Maybe they're not even practicing. And then the next one is one who practices for others, but not for oneself. And this is actually the second worst, <laughs> right? You're practicing for others, but not yourself. Now, I usually think that's probably the third, like second best rather than second worst, because it's probably better to practice for others than just for myself. But the Buddha actually said that the next best is the one who practices for oneself, but not for others. And I think that's why, because if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't actually help anyone. And of course, the best person is the one who practices for both one's own and others benefit. So that's the best. But please don't practice only for others and forget yourself. I spoke with another friend um, yesterday, I think, and I can't say who they are, but unfortunately the whole family have got COVID now. And um, it's pretty sad because this person um, has been through a really hard time in the last couple of years and uh, yeah, has gone through some betrayal and you know, struggling there with family relationships and then being in the house with this, with this big family who now have all got sick. And uh, for a long time, I've been wishing that she could take care of herself better because I could see her wearing herself down, you know. And even with COVID, she was saying to me, oh, I'm just trying my best to look after everyone. I'm just really trying to make sure everyone's okay. I'm trying to keep sort of the older people in the house away from the young ones who, because the older person um, doesn't yet have a positive test. And she said, it's impossible because, you know, they're coming into the kitchen and they're mingling. And I said, look, you know, there's nothing you can do about this. I mean, they're all in the same house. You're all going to get it. Please just try and do something that looks after yourself. So I told her about this breathing method because that's a really good one for increasing the oxygen and the capacity of the lungs, as well as calming down the nervous system and promoting good sleep. That's the five-five breath. The five-five is called uh, cardiac 
coherence if you want to check it out it has some scientific a lot of scientific research and I've been doing that every day now for I don't know maybe at least half an hour a day and throughout the day when I remember and um, it has a very calming effect so I was telling her about that and uh, and just noticing this pattern really strongly I realized also while I was talking to her that um, I have a similar pattern which is why I can see it in her <laughs> you know usually we can see what's obvious in everyone else and we forget that it's there in ourselves but I think sometimes this sort of uh, programming is because we've spent our whole lives operating a certain way and that's the way we've earned love or that's the way we think we need to be to deserve to be loved you know and it's actually very scary sometimes to change that but unfortunately you know putting everybody else's needs first does mean that you neglect yourself quite often and you do get run down so in the long run it's not actually a, a, a very uh, healthy pattern and I think we sometimes need to challenge our beliefs you know, they may have been true when we were children, right? We needed to assure, ensure that our parents were there for us. We didn't want to shout at them and send them away, you know? We wanted them to pick us up and give us a cuddle when we were struggling. But now, nothing's going to go wrong if we're not everything for everybody all the time. You know, it's not a terrible failure and we can give ourselves some space. And this uh, person's child actually said to her once, uh, because she teaches her about meditation, she said, um, mommy, I'm going to look after myself now and give myself some compassion. <laughs> so I said to my friend, can you also tell your daughter then? Can you say like, okay, now I'm going to do it as well. So, you know, I'm just going to close the door and I'm going to practice what I've told you. <laughs> so sometimes we do need to lead by example and do what we advise others to do. So how else can self-compassion help us? There's a lot I wanted to say as usual, um, <laughs> but one of the main ways, which I guess I've touched on already, is that it helps us develop a healthy relationship to our emotions, to our feelings inside. You know, it helps us to lean in towards suffering. And if we only lean in with mindfulness, sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes we're not resourced enough. We don't have that resilience that the compassion can give us and that sense of warmth and compassion and care. So again, it's part of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Mindfulness plus kindness makes kindfulness. So this is the self-compassion, compassion, along with the mindfulness, which helps us to actually stay with our experience also long enough for us to see what's happening so that we can understand how we work. We have to understand suffering in order to be free from suffering. And then I think another way is that um, it can help us to integrate those feelings, those difficult feelings, first of all, to become aware of them, but also integrate and, as I say, become free. So to activate that wish to be free from suffering and not just get stuck in the suffering state itself. It can also help us to forgive our mistakes because the more self-compassion we have, the more forgiving we are of our own shortcomings and weaknesses. <clears throat> and as Ajahn Brahmali said to everybody yesterday, you know, we can learn from our mistakes. Mistakes aren't necessarily a bad thing. It's information, right? It's information that we can use to, to move more towards our own and others' benefit. And if we have more compassion to ourselves, then we're less um, sort of shaken when we make a mistake and therefore we can open ourselves to it and learn yeah if we don't want to learn from mistakes then we're going to try so hard not to make them we're going to really get ourselves quite stressed but one thing if you have done something recently is that you can always apologize right we can always apologize to others and um, we can also apologize to ourselves you know, sometimes we've hurt ourselves by our behavior or our actions and we can actually just extend forgiveness to ourselves. Not necessarily only for something we've done, but even forgiving the feelings. Yeah? Forgiving the difficult feelings that might arise, forgiving the anxiety that can you know, really catch in your stomach, forgiving the sadness and the grief that from time to time might arise. Can we forgive those emotions? Can we open to them and just accept that, yeah, this is part of being a human being. Yeah, it's part of our shared humanity. 
So actually making space for these things so that we can learn. <laughs> One of my friends recently said to me, um, you know, we can always say sorry, but we shouldn't just say sorry just for breathing. So there's also a limit to that as well, you know, because sometimes it can go into kind of apologizing even for existing on this planet and it shouldn't go into that. <laughs> and then I remembered um, a little clip that I saw on YouTube ages ago. It was an experiment they did and it was in England which is the land of solitude. <laughs> we all say sorry for everything, right? Definitely just for breathing. And uh, there was a challenge where they said, okay, we're gonna have this experiment and we want to find out who can get the most sorries in a single morning. So each person had to go out and try and collect sorries, okay? And the person who won <laughs> was somebody who placed themselves at the bottom of an escalator just slightly in front of the escalator steps, but not very much in front. And she just sat there. And every single person that went past said, sorry, sorry, <laughs> as they tried to go past. And <laughs> I don't know if that's funny if you're not English, but in England, that's just really strange actually, because you know they haven't done anything. Like they're saying sorry because somebody's in their way. <laughs> so it's a kind of like sorry that I'm here but also a kind of passive aggressive like sorry can you get out of my way and it's just really weird so I thought that was really quite funny because she apparently got like hundreds and well probably thousands she was like in the um underground you know on one of these escalators and just everyone who was going past it was like oh sorry 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 <laughs> so we don't go to extremes okay but we can always apologize which is fine and lastly i guess because we are running out of time i'd like to give you some uh, space for questions but the last thing i wanted to say is that our self-worth is very much um, related to how how far we can not only develop self-compassion to ourselves and self-compassion is an antidote to a lack of self-worth but I think low self-worth sometimes actually inhibits us from receiving compassion from others. And this is something really interesting. You know, it's almost like the Brahma Viharas have three aspects. We practice them to ourselves, we practice them towards others, but we also have to learn to receive. And I noticed in myself recently, especially when I was speaking with Ajahn Brahm recently, that um, there's a lot of distance between us, right? <laughs> He's in Perth and I'm in England. And sometimes it feels like two very different worlds, even though I've been there a lot and he's been here and I still feel very close to my teacher, but it does feel increasingly like two very separate worlds. And I think part of it is the isolation that I experience, you know, not seeing people for so long, but also the fact that the COVID over there is, at least in Western Australia, it, they've kept it so under control that life is just continuing as normal. And as Ajahn Brahmali said yesterday, they're actually quite enjoying it because they don't have as many visitors or they have, they have a lot of visitors, so they still get lots and lots of food, but they don't have to travel and teach and they don't have to you know, receive overseas visitors. So it's actually a bit of a holiday, a bit of a break where they still get the same food. So sometimes I feel like this sense of distance. And I said to Ajahn, I said like, I just want to feel like I know you care right I know that you're supporting me but sometimes it's hard to feel it and I realized when I was saying it that it could be to do with like not necessarily feeling allowed not allowing myself to receive it you know because perhaps I feel I have to do better or have a monastery first or you know be several steps ahead from where I am and so sometimes it's actually a lack of valuing ourself, valuing what we've done, valuing that we are good enough, that can actually prevent us from receiving the love and the kindness that's there in the world. Yeah, so self-compassion can help with that. It can help us to overcome that lack of self-worth, to embrace every aspect of ourselves, including the difficult, including the painful, you know, including the grief. It doesn't matter why you're feeling grief. I mean, I was feeling it for a couple of days and I think it's, you know, a sense of grieving for the whole situation. It's much more than my own grief. And sometimes it can be so healthy just to feel that and experience it and allow yourself to cry. You know, again, it's part of our common humanity. It helps us attune to each other and it helps us connect much more. So sometimes this can also help us to just 
receive a little bit of kindness and care. And ultimately through this practice, we can learn to receive our own kindness and care and not be quite so de um, dependent on another figuring whether we're worth it, you know, or another for our so-called validation that we don't really need at all. But sometimes we really do depend on others for that. And with the practice of self-compassion, we can start to be much more independent and, and realize we have all the tools we need to soothe ourselves, yeah. So some of those tools, again, just to quickly recap, some of the medicine of self-compassion is taking those deep breaths, and this is a, a method that's particularly good for anxiety. So again, you know, there's lots of benefits to breathing, to just being with your breath, whether you want to take deep breaths or just the regular breath, just flowing with that is very, very calming for the mind and the nervous system. And then adding that compassion to the way that you're aware. Maybe it helped, I don't know, it gave you some more tools. If you can imagine that you're this compassionate being, present for yourself, present for your breath, present for your experience. And really imagine, like an actor or an actress, you know, imagine, I think it's a gender neutral word, so I'll just say actor, but get into the role. You know, you're this wise, kind, compassionate being. What is wisdom? What is it to be wise? You know, to look at the world, to look at your experience through the eyes that know the truths of impermanence. They know suffering. They know non-self. So you embody this, you be this, and you'll find it connects you to that part of yourself that's intuitively wise. So that's the kind of imagery. And we can also evoke other imagery, sort of we can imagine we're in a safe place or we can imagine we're with, say, a teacher or a benefactor or a very good friend. And when we create that safe environment, it's the same kind of environment that a child needs to feel held. You know, a child needs a safe and loving place in order to learn to hold their emotions, to deal with their emotions. So we can create that space for ourselves. You know, you might imagine a nice golden or orange setting sun. or I don't know, what, what is safety to you? A field of daisies or lying under, I don't know, a beautiful copper beech tree like we have here, but not, yeah, now it has no leaves. So you can imagine this. And then again, another one is to... Um, use these phrases of loving kindness, you know, pick something that works for you. Whatever I offered is just one way to go about it, but you can find your own um, inner dialogue, inner monologue uh, to evoke those feelings of care. And this can be a practice that can take you into quite deep samadhi because that becomes the object of your meditation, just as we do in the metta. We just change the word slightly to freedom from suffering or to may I be kind to my whatever, to my experience, to myself, to my anxiety, to my fear. May I be kind to it? Or may I learn to care? May I learn to be kind? Yeah? So go gently with that. And then, yeah, another way is, of course, to breathe in and out. You know, you can breathe in compassion. You can breathe out compassion to others. And also we can go through the categories. So, you know, if you want to do the self-compassion, you can then bring up a person who you know is suffering, maybe someone who you care about and, and really, you know, send them this compassion with the feeling of, may you be free from suffering. Connecting with that suffering, but then focusing on the wish for their freedom from suffering, imagining them with a smile, sending them your smile and just allowing that to suffuse your own body and mind. And you will, with time, become the recipient of your own kindness too. So this can take you very far in the path into the deep meditations and of course, purify your whole motivation for practice. And once we do experience, you know, increasingly these states of mind which are free from the hindrances, we have more of a chance to see the reality of things as they are. So very much encouraged to try the self-compassion um, even when it feels counterintuitive or, you know, a little bit silly or <laughs> naive, you know, see how it's connected to suffering and see how it can help you to find that resilience, that strength to meet the whole of life. Okay. Good. So I ended up talking quite a while. <laughs> Maybe I'll give you an extra five minutes for, we'll do 15 minutes, see if anyone has anything they'd like to share. 
or um, complain about or or add or ask a question about whatever it is you're very free so um we're going to continue recording so i think it's pinned to me you won't be on the video but your voice will be on the video okay <laughs> so if you want to be totally anonymous because something terrible has happened and you want to speak totally anonymously then please put it in the chat box and i'll read it out otherwise it's really lovely when people hear the recording to hear other voices than my own yeah so it just <clears throat> is more interesting and people can relate to you as well so yes i can see some hands and the way to put your hand up is to go to the participants button and uh, there's a raise hand option in there so i'll leave it to whoever's doing the questions one of my co-hosts will do it and they will say your name hopefully and then unmute you yeah rob has a question great you did it once um, you me? there you go is that working yeah okay um good evening everyone um, I just wanted to ask whether you could say something about how to develop equanimity so that it interacts with the other Brahma. The mm. Well, okay, yeah, that's a great question. There's different ways, and I mean, it would be a whole talk. It's maybe a talk I could attempt at another time. Um, but in brief, I think there's two ways. One of them is, well, there's more than two ways. The way I used to practice it was very much towards sensations in the body, whatever would arise. And so that was about developing the perception of impermanence towards all physical, mostly physical um, sensations, but also mental experiences, thoughts and moods, emotions, um, and really learning to see them arising and passing um, at quite a great speed. So the mindfulness was very strong and I gradually developed my capacity to stay present uh, for longer periods and to all kinds of different sensations and moods. And so the equanimity developed because it was based on an understanding of impermanence. And so there was no real point, you know, even it's not like a, a cognitive thing. It's like there is no emotional response after a while to things which you know are changing. There's no purpose, there's no need to react because you see them just in a flux, in a flow. So that's one really helpful way. But as a Brahma Vihara, it's a bit different. And as a Brahma Vihara, I would say that it's a natural result of practicing the other Brahma Viharas. And that to skip straight to equanimity would be missing a lot because I think equanimity is not impartiality. It's actually a very wise, beautiful, embracing sense of calm it sort of literally means looking over like upeka, like I think it's something like looking over. So it's a kind of really unconditional awareness. And I don't think it's possible to get straight to that without kindness and compassion and joy. So my experience with equanimity more as a Brahma Vihara happened quite spontaneously. Um, in a particularly notable sitting where I was practicing loving kindness and compassion quite deeply. And then with the object of compassion at some point after resonating with her, it turned into equanimity. It just became more spacious, more expansive and more cool, I can say. But it was also with a real understanding that there is just this suffering in the world and we can, we can respond as far as we can. We can do as much as we can but we'll never solve all the problems in the world. And this is where the only real solution to that is to you know, walk on this path to its end because the only real end of suffering is, is full enlightenment. So they say that equanimity is perfected in the fourth jhana. So it's a very, very high state of mindfulness. Um, and sometimes you can correlate those Brahma Viharas with the four jhanas as well. I'm not so sure. I mean, I think the way that I'm learning it is more that any of them can take you into the jhanas, but I would really recommend um, focusing a lot on the first metta, definitely, and compassion from time to time, mudita from time to time. And um, equanimity will probably strengthen as a result. And also you can practice equanimity in the sense of looking on 
without judgment, with a sense of um, unconditional awareness. So there are a few tips. So there's another person. Yeah, Tom, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I only, I only found you yesterday on YouTube and I was <laughs> oh. all day today because when I heard you talk about self-compassion and self-love, I went, oh, I wouldn't, I'd like a bit of that, you know. <laughs> I wonder, do you have like a simple, I don't know if it's the right form, but I'm always at airports reading the, the dummy's guide to um, computers and the dummy's guide to whatever. Do you have a few simple tips for a guy who's been, uh, who has not been good to himself and his mind hasn't been his best friend for 40 years and now is trying this path? Mm. It's a lot to take in. Yeah. It is a lot to take in, yeah. Um, and don't worry, you don't have to take it all in, first of all, because these sessions are offered to a real range of people, some who've been practicing many years, some who've just begun, um, some who may have done these kind of practices, some who may have been doing completely different practices, you know. So I just kind of take up slightly different things each week. And I would say, first of all, whatever, um just seems to appeal to you give that a go if anything from tonight say in the meditation say if you enjoyed being with your breath or if you just enjoyed relaxing your body or if one or two of those phrases resonated you could just try that for short periods of time um, so i would say if you're just starting with the meditation you've not been very kind to yourself don't set yourself challenges at all just give yourself complete permission to decide how much you want to practice and when. Um, it might be five minutes, you know, during a busy time of the day, you might think, okay, maybe it would be good for me to just stop for a moment. You know, that might mean close your eyes and meditate. It might mean just take a bit longer over your cup of tea, you know, or just read something that's uplifting instead of reading the nearest thing at hand or, you know, choose to listen to a Dhamma talk instead of scrolling through depressing news, for example, and just start to notice those choices and start to notice the effect on your mind. Because generally, when we start to make choices that are for our own benefit, it also fosters a sense of self-respect. And we start to think, oh, it actually feels quite nice to be kind. Another thing that you might want to start noticing is the way you speak to yourself because sometimes if we have this habit not to be kind to ourselves, it's often a result of negative thinking like thoughts that are not very kind and if you can start to notice that notice the way you speak to yourself and you do find oh it's not very kind don't worry just notice it and over time you might be able to actually substitute that thought for something a little bit gentler. Like for example, in my retreat in the summer, most of the time I was really speaking very kindly to myself because I had the time and I was doing a lot of meta practice. Um, but then just one day I noticed that I was sort of getting impatient about whether, trying to make a decision whether I could have a cup of tea. And I said to myself mentally, oh, for good, oh come on, you know, oh, kind of, come on, just decide. And I realized that sometimes how I'd been spoken to by others, you know, oh, for goodness sake, stop fussing kind of thing. And I just was like, oh, I saw it. I paused and I said, it's fine, darling. If you'd like a cup of tea, you can have one. You know, you don't have to decide now. So just like that, we can sometimes catch ourselves and just learn to phrase it a little bit differently. I'm also aware that I'm now giving you a load more stuff. <laughs> So I don't want to say too many things, but I'm really glad you've come. It's absolutely lovely that you were here. And uh, yeah, you just spoke from such an authentic place, which I think everyone can relate to, you know. So just know you're in good company. We're all just learning step by step. And uh, it's just nice to be able to um, know that we're not alone with the practice. So really warm welcome. And I hope you come again. Um, yeah. You can also, of course, listen to talks afterwards, listen to guided meditations. And if you're really keen on finding something that speaks to you, there's a lot of stuff online as well.
but go easy is my main advice. <laughs> go gently, go easy, take your time. Good, so I did say we'd go over by giving you, <laughs> Mel's looking a bit disappointed. <laughs> No, you're coming very soon, Mel, but just in case there's one more question, because I don't want to like talk so much that I remove anyone else's opportunity. I'll do a quick one, I think. Jennifer has her hand up, is that right? Jennifer? I'm seeing that. Yes. Um, can you Excellent. Hear? Yes. Okay. Hi. Good. Uh, hello. Um, so, um, yeah, first of all, thank you for um, this topic of self-compassion, which is also a topic I'm discovering for myself at the moment. And uh, not just at the moment, but for quite, quite a while now. And uh, I just wanted to comment that uh, um, I had... Um, um, a very painful experience in a hospital. It was when the COVID was not that all over the place, but it was just kind of starting. So, uh, um, and I just want to say that uh, in um, relating to physical pain, that what helped me a lot in that situation was that I suddenly had this thought, this kind of like a voice of self-compassion in my mind and that really helped me to kind of make it in that physically painful situation because um, back then it was already not allowed to have um, uh, visitors or people from the family in the hospital. So this mm. made it a bit uh, difficult for me. And then um, I had no other person. So kind of in my own mind, there suddenly kind of was this self-compassion voice or person right. and I just wanted to point out that uh, yeah that also for the physical pain self-compassion is a really tremendously helpful thing yeah great great thank you Jennifer nice thank to you. see you nice to hear you and um, it's a very important point and I think um, it's just amazing how if you do have a practice and you do reflect on things like self-compassion and just try to sort of see yourself with kinder eyes, it will come up when you least expect it. And sometimes when you most need it as well, it will just come up like, a, a, like I mentioned about my thought, it just automatically changed itself because I recognized, oh, that's a thought of harm. And yeah, they just come up when you need them to. So this is one of the beautiful results of the practice. It's not that we get fireworks straight away, but with the consistent practice, you might just start noticing that you're speaking to yourself more kindly and that, yeah, when you need it, sometimes it's there. So good, good to notice that and rejoice in that. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to uh, ask you for five more minutes so that Mel can just say a few words. And then after that, we will all wave goodbye. So. Please, Thanks, Jennifer. Well, thank you. And what a wonderful talk on self-compassion. Um, and I was thinking I'd be a bit compassionate to myself and come off the screen soon because I've been on it since six. Um, but I just wanted to um, say a few words to the community on the Buddhist practice of dana because um, we haven't talked about it for a little while. And some, some newer members might not know that um, dana means generosity in Pali. And it refers to the act of giving as well as also the actual donation itself. So these talks are all offered on a by donation basis. And the, the Buddha teaches that dana is a really important part of our spiritual path and serves as a foundation for our practice. So it can help us let go of some of our own self-interest and also help to cultivate a mind of joy, loving kindness and compassion that we've been hearing all about tonight. So I'd like to invite anybody that feels uh, they're able to do so to donate um, and I'm popping the link into the, the website and any funds um, gratefully received go towards not only caring for Venerable Chanda's everyday needs but also towards the wider aim of the um, Anakampa Bikuni project 
but ultimately we all hope one day in, in slightly different <laughs> times to be able to gather together and uh, celebrate together. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd also I, like to just take the opportunity to thank everybody for their support because we are being supported and happily, you know, the basic needs are being met and we're still managing to make some modest savings towards the monastery. So it's of course less than it may have been if we would have had the tours and, you know, if uh, things were kind of flowing the way that they were before, but we are still, we're not uh, using our savings and we're still making, uh, making our way towards our aims bit by bit. Um, and I'm not sure if I should say this because I think a lot of you are also supporting me by offering food, but there is an opportunity to write to the team Derek is one of the admins there. It's team at anukampaproject.org. And another way is to offer uh, some food. So uh, that's another way, but usually that's okay. I think we've got quite a bit uh, coming in at least for the next month, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah. So, so yeah, however you feel moved to support and thank you for your support by just being here. You know, your practice is also a marvellous way that you support this and I'm just so delighted that we've managed to cultivate and strengthen this community throughout this pandemic time it's just fantastic um, because you weren't there before <laughs> some of you were there individually but you weren't there as a group and you know this is, brings me so much happiness and so much of a sense of meaning and joy so thank you everyone so we will uh, unmute you now or give you permission to unmute.